بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قبة للمتقين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وأنفعنا بما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending his salutations on the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I begin with the greeting of Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, Firstly, apologies for being late um, Obviously typical British weather uh, caused a lot of traffic so apologies for that uh, and as the brother mentioned this is my first ISOC talk um, I actually graduated recently alhamdulillah um, but oh, it's an honour to be invited by the University of uh, Westminster uh, and especially the ISOC I remember when I was at uni at Queen Mary um, I was part of the ISOC and this is an advice that I've given to the brothers it's very important to, and sisters it's very important to be part of an ISOC uh, it's somewhere where your Iman is built together somewhere where you will meet and have friendships that last throughout your life even after you graduate these are the friendships that you will keep and it's important for you as a Muslim to have that connection to have that place where you can come and pray together to have that place where you can come and um, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions that on the day of ju judgment there will be seven seven specific people will be given a shade on the day when there is no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one of those people is two people who meet for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they depart for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's all they do they're friends or they might not even be friends but they just meet and they leave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you, you come into the ISOC when you come to the ISOC and you meet your friends or you meet your other Muslim brothers and sisters you can have that intention of I'm just going to meet this person simply for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're going to do acts of worship together, we're going to go to ISOC talk together, talks together and then we're going to leave. And that way you will be inshallah ta'ala amongst those seven whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives shade to. Um, with regards to the actual lecture, so the lecture is on Iman and I know that on Monday you covered the uh, pillars of Islam. So the hadith that we're going through is known as the hadith Jibril, where a man came and the Sahaba, they were sitting around, the man came to process some and he was wearing clean clothes and no one had ever seen him. And he came and he asked the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu certain questions. So we already covered the pillars of Islam on Monday and now the second part is the pillars of Iman. About the hadith itself, um, some, some other benefits, uh, one of the scholars of the past, he mentioned that if Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, is known as Ummul Quran, then this hadith is known as Ummul Hadith because of what it covers. And also many of the scholars of the past, they've explained this hadith and there's, in fact, there's volumes of books. So we're going to go through it, inshallah, in one lecture. But in reality, every single part needs a book or needs a seminar. So each pillar of Iman that I'm going to go through, we could talk for days and days about them. But inshallah, I'm going to condense it so you can learn about what the six pillars of uh, Iman are um, in general. So after the pillars of Islam, um, the, the man who came, as we later find out, was Jibreel. And he was an angel in the form of a man. He said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ iman." He says, so inform me about Iman. So what is Iman? Iman, the scholars have mentioned, it is, al, from a language point of view, it means iqra, which means to um, accept. From a sharia point of view, from a technical point of view, if someone was to ask you, what is iman? Iman is iqra bil qalb wa natq bil lisan wal amal bil jawarih. What that means is, when someone says, what is iman exactly? It is belief in the heart, it is words on the tongue, and it is actions of the limbs. That is what Iman is. Iman, it increases with worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it decreases with disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Iman increases and decreases. Sometimes you might be uh, have a low point in your life and your Iman is quite low. And that's a time when you need to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase your Iman. Sometimes you might feel, especially after attending an uh, ISOC lecture, or maybe you're with brothers or your sisters and you feel your Iman is high. So you want to, as a Muslim, get to a point where your Iman is always high because it increases and decreases. And the way to increase it is by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing good deeds. 
and the way it decreases is by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and later in the lecture inshallah we'll talk about other ways to increase your iman so it's belief in the heart so a lot of these things that we are going to go through are things of the unseen that a Muslim must believe because it's belief in the heart and as we go through them you'll see that many of these things you won't see with your eyes that's something that you must believe as a Muslim so the first pillar of Iman the Prophet Muhammad Islam, when he was asked what is Iman, he said, Al Imanu an tu'mina billah. That Iman is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are six pillars of Iman. Uh, the first is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this lecture is more of a uh, learning lecture rather than an Iman booster as such. It's more learning how to give you various types, various anwa. So it might be useful, inshallah, if you guys can get pen and paper out. There's a lot to take in, or even just your phones, and write it on your phones. Um, there'll be a lot to take in, because you find that Iman is not as just simple as, oh, it's just to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's different levels to it. There are different types. There are various branches. So, to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consists of four things. So, to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consists of four things. The first is that you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. That's the first thing. So, as a Muslim... We must believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. That's the first part. Not the first pillar of Iman. That's the first part of believing in Allah. The second is that you must believe in Allah's wububiyya. Now what that means is you must believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship. So you must believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who created you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who sustains you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who provides for you. He is the one who's been looking after you from the time you were born all the way until your death. And the evidence for this is, one of the evidences, there are many. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter, that He is the one who created for you for the, from the earth, everything. He created everything for you from the earth. He created for you from the earth, everything. So that's what the first part is. To believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rububiyya. That he is the Rabb. He is the one who created us, sustained us, protects us, provides for us. And this is the first part or the second part of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third part is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uluhiyya. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uluhiyya means is to believe that he is the one worthy of worship. So you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. Now you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. Now the next thing is to believe that he is the one who is deserving of worship. And to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means to direct all your worship for him alone. And to not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the opposite of so, uh, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you must stay away from shirk, but make sure that you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, with no partners. And as a side thing, shirk, the, the lesson isn't about shirk, but shirk uh, is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to put something or someone or a deity alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the dangers of shirk, the first one is that it is never forgiven. If you die upon shirk, it will not be forgiven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah will not forgive those who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he may forgive other than that for whom he wills. So if you die upon shirk, it won't be forgiven. The second thing from the dangers of shirk is that it makes Jannah haram for you. So the one who commits shirk or the one who practices shirk, he cannot enter Jannah ever. He will never ever enter Jannah. And the third is that the one who practices or commits shirk, all of his past sins, or all of his past deeds are nullified. So if you were a Muslim your whole life for 60 years, you worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and then when you just on your deathbed you committed shirk, all of your past good deeds are nullified. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. So the first thing is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uluhiyya, which means that he is the one worthy of worship alone. The fourth thing is to believe in Allah's asma wa sifat. 
to believe in Allah's names and attributes. So we must, as a Muslim, from our Iman, from our Iman in believing Allah is that we must believe in His names and attributes. And what that means is that you believe in the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without distorting them, without denying them, without likening them, and without asking how. So within that category, there's four things that we must do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. So let's say, for example, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. We must believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the All-Knowing without denying it, without distorting it, without likening it to his creation and without uh, asking how. Same thing with all his names and attributes. We don't ask how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hands and we don't ask how do they look like. We know that he has it and we believe in it and we don't distort the meanings and we don't deny it. So that's the fourth thing with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we should believe. So remember we said that Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consists of four things. The first is that you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. The second is that you believe in his rububiya, which you believe that he is the Lord, that he is the one who created us, he is the one who sustains us. You believe, third is that you believe in his uluhiya, which is that you believe that he is the one who is worthy of worship and you should not associate partners with him. And the fourth is that you believe in his asma wa sifat, which means that you believe in his names and attributes. Then after that, the Prophet Sallallahu said, wa malaikatihi. So we've completed the first part of Iman, the first pillar of Iman, which is to believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And I can go further, but due to time, um, if we keep going into that, we can go on for days. So we finished the first pillar. The second pillar is to believe in his angels. So the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned his angels first after mentioning Allah is because believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels is from the unseen. So the ones after that come, Qutubihi, Rasulihi, his books and his messengers, these are from things that happened in the past that people saw. Whereas as for angels, they're from the unseen. So the angels, the angels, angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are made from light. They are another creation. They are from the unseen and they are made from light. And from believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels, there are a number of things that we must believe. The first is that we must believe in their names. So we've been given the names of some angels. We must believe that the angels that we've been told about, that we believe that they exist. So from the ones that we know, I'm sure you all know it, is, I know them, uh, Jibreel. So we know that Jibreel exists and he is an angel from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Mikael. We know he exists and he is from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Israfil. We know he exists and he is from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are some of the angels that we know. So Jibreel Specifically, if you go for the angels now, the ones whom, whose names we know, Jibreel, he is in charge of Wahi. So he is in charge of revelation. So every angel has a duty. They're all made from light, but they all have individual duties. So Jibreel, he is made from light and he is in charge of revelation. He is the one who um, came and delivered the message or delivered the Quran to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as you all know the story in the cave of Hira, when he came and he squeezed the Prophet that was Jibreel because he is in charge of Wahi. The second is Mikael. Now Mikael, he is in charge of the rain. So Mikael, he is an angel and he is in charge of the rain. Then we have Israfil. Now, Israfil, he is in charge of blowing the trumpet. So towards the end of their judgment, the trumpet will be blown. And that will cause every single living thing to die. And Israfil, that is his role. He is in charge of blowing the trumpet. The second thing we must believe in terms of the angels is that we must believe their roles. So we mentioned that some of the roles of angels, but there's angels whose names we don't know. But we must believe they exist 
and we must believe in their roles. So we know these three. We know that Jibreel exists and his name. We know Mikael, we know his name. We know Israfil, we know his name. But there's many angels whose names we don't know, but we know what they do. For example, we know that there are angels who are in charge of protecting the human beings, protecting the Muslims. When you read your Adhkar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels to protect you. We know that there are angels who are, who are in charge of um, asking the questions in the grave. So we know when we're put in the grave that we will be asked three questions. The angels will ask us, who is your Lord? Who is, uh, what is your religion? And who is this man? Meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So there's angels in charge of that. Then there are angels who are in charge of um, praising, well they're not in charge of it, they're, they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. That's their only role. And, for, and generally for angels, something I missed is that angels, they don't have free will. They can only listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So humans, we have free will. Angels, they must obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have a choice in that. They were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they must obey Him. They don't have a choice. So from the angels is those who just praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all day and all night. And we know from a hadith from the story of Isfah al Miraj, the Prophet said that in the heavens there are angels. There's a, in the heavens, so we have the Kaaba on earth. In the heavens there's a uh, house of Allah, house of worship called Al Baytul Ma'mur, which means the off. Uh, visited house. The Prophet said, and this house that is in the heavens, there are 70,000 angels. They enter every day, they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they leave and they never return. So subhanahu imagine from the beginning of time, there's been 70,000 angels. They visited this uh, house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they worshiped there, and then they left and they never came back. But every single day there's a new 70,000, 70,000. Yesterday there was a new 70,000. Today there's a new 70,000. Tomorrow there'll be a new 70,000. Next week there'll be a new 70,000. So we don't know the number of angels. But from this hadith, we can uh, derive that smaller. There's, there is many, 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 many angels. But we don't know the exact number. And from the, uh, from the roles of angels, are there will be angels who will send peace on us when we enter Jannah, inshallah. So there are angels who are appointed and they are just there to say assalamu alaikum and to send peace when you enter Jannah. And then we know that also there's an angel who is a guardian of the hellfire. He is a guardian of the hellfire. So that is with regards to the belief of angels. So after that, the Prophet Muhammad Islam he says, after malaikatihi, he says, wa kutubihi. Wa kutubihi means belief in the books. So now we've covered belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from the pillars of Iman. The first pillar of Iman is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second pillar of Iman is to believe in His angels. The third pillar of Iman is to believe in the books. Now what this means is the books that were revealed to messengers, to people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. So we have to believe in these books. And this is from the scene, it's not from the unseen. For us it's from the unseen, but it happened in the past. So these are real physical books. So we have to believe in the books that were sent. So the books that we know, obviously we have the final book, which is the Quran. Then we have the Torah, we have the Injil, we have the Zabur, and we have the Suhuf Ibrahim. And we also have uh, Suhuf Musa. These are the names of the books that we know. There were other books that were sent, but we don't, we don't know their names. But these are the names of the books that we do know. The Quran, the Injil. So the Injil is the Bible, which was sent to Isa Islam. The Torah, which is sent to Musa Islam. The Zabur, which was sent to Dawood Islam. And Suhuf Ibrahim, which Suhuf uh, means pages of Ibrahim, which was sent to Ibrahim Islam. Now, the only one that remains to this day is the Qur'an. All the others have been changed over time. However, the original books, they were all books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, all the books that we mentioned originally, they were from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they've been just changed over time. But the one that hasn't been changed to this day, and this is from the miracles of the Qur'an, is the Qur'an. Hasn't been changed to this day. Now, 
from our belief in the books, we have to believe believe that everything that was revealed in those books is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, from the old previous books, like we mentioned, things have been changed. Now, if we come across a verse or a passage that is authentic and we know it hasn't been distorted, what do we do with it? Do we act upon it? Do we not act upon it? So the scholars, they mentioned that there's three scenarios. So when you come across a book from a verse from a previous book that was revealed and it's authentic and it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you do in three, three different scenarios? The first is if it agrees with our Sharia, with the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if it agrees with the Quran, then you must act upon it. The second is if it goes against our Sharia, if it goes against what we have been taught by Muhammad sallallahu or our Quran, then we must reject it. So we reject it if it contradicts. And the third and final is that if it neither confirms or agrees with what we have been taught, nor does it uh, contradict anything that we have been taught, then we remain silent on it. We don't say it's the truth and we don't say it's a lie. So you can't say that, oh, it's definitely incorrect, or you can't say that it's definitely incorrect. We just remain silent on it. But the main one is, if it agrees with the Qur'an, if it agrees with our Sharia, then we accept it and we act upon it. And the second one is, if it contradicts our Sharia, contradicts our Qur'an, then we reject it. With regards to uh, the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must believe that they were sent to prophets. We're going to go to messengers later. So we must believe, the first is that they were sent to messengers. The second is, we must believe that whatever is confirmed by the Qur'an from the previous books is the truth. And then the second is that we must not act upon something that goes against our sharia so it's related to the other thing and the last thing is we must believe in their names we must believe in the names so we mentioned the names of the books the first is the quran the second is the injil and the torah then the zabur then the suhuf of ibrahim and the suhuf of musa and there were other books but we just don't know the names but these are the ones whose names we know okay so now we've said that iman is to believe in allah to believe in his messengers to believe in his books. So we've covered three pillars of Iman. Now there's six, right? So there's three left. So the fourth pillar of Iman is to believe wa is to believe in his messengers. So we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent messengers. And all the messengers, they all came with the same message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we sent to every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from Tawhut. So they all called to the same message, which was the message of Tawheed. They all came with the same message. So we believe that the messengers, they were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the question comes, what's the difference between a messenger and a prophet? Because there's prophets and there's messengers. Now there's a difference. So the difference between a messenger and a prophet. A prophet is somebody who follows the sharia of the messenger who came before him. And the messenger, Rasul, is somebody who was uh, given wahi, who was given revelation. And he then um, spreads that book that he was given. So that's the difference. And a prophet, he spreads the book or he acts upon the book of the messenger before him. So not every single prophet is a messenger, but every single messenger is a prophet. So remember this concept, remember this rule, that not every single prophet is a messenger, but every single messenger is a prophet as well. So for example, uh, Musa alayhi salam, he was given the uh, Torah. That is a new wahi, that is a new book. And it cancels out what was given before and he follows it and he spreads it. Likewise, the Quran, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was given the Quran. So therefore, he's a messenger. He's a prophet and a messenger. Adam Alaihi Wasallam, he is just a prophet. He wasn't a messenger. He wasn't given a book. The first messenger was Nuh Alaihi Wasallam. He was the first messenger, Nuh Alaihi Wasallam. 
and the final messenger is our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So from the belief of believing in Rasulihi and believing in his messengers is that we believe that the first messenger was Nuh and the last messenger is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And to disbelieve in one messenger means disbelieving in all of them. So as a Muslim, we must believe in all of them. We must believe in all the prophets. If we deny one messenger, then we deny all of them. So obviously we follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but we don't deny the other prophets that came and we don't disbelieve in them. We believe in them as well. And the best of them was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the... Um, the life of Muhammad Islam obviously needs a whole new uh, chapter. Now, in terms of messengers, so there's five messengers who are known as Ulul Azm. So they're the best of the best. So we said the Prophet Islam, he's the best of the best of the best of the top. But then from the messengers and the prophets, there's five. There's five of them who are the greatest five. From them is Nuh Islam. Then we have uh, Ibrahim Islam. Then we have Musa Islam. Then we have Isa Islam, and then we have Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these are the five greatest. These are the five greatest prophets, and the best of them, like we mentioned, from them is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and specifically Ibrahim Islam. He was known as the Khalil of Allah, which is the friend of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And also Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was also given this title, which differentiates them um, from the others. Okay, so now we've covered four of the six pillars of iman. First one, believing in Allah. Then believing in His angels. Then believing in His books. Then believing in His messengers. Now the fifth pillar of iman is to believe in the day of judgment, yawm al akhir. Now it's called Yawm Al-Akhir because it's the last day. That's why it's called Yawm Al-Akhir. It's the last uh, station that a Muslim or a human, forget Muslim, a human being has before he either goes to Jannah or Jahannam. So this consists of a number of matters too. The first is that you believe that the day of judgment will happen. It's a day that is one day, day of judgment, but it will last for 50,000 years, meaning it's as if it's for 50,000 years, but it's one day. And it will be as if it's for 50,000 years. The second is to believe everything that will happen in it that is confirmed by Allah SWT in the Quran or that is confirmed authentically by Muhammad SAW in an authentic hadith. So everything that we're told about it, we must believe in it. And we'll go through, inshallah, what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. Um, but generally, belief in the Day of Judgment, that's what it includes. Then we must also believe that from the Day of Judgment, that the Prophet Muhammad will intercede for us. That the Prophet he will have a fountain that we will drink from. And whoever drinks from this fountain, he will never be thirsty again. And we must believe in uh, the Sirat, which we will explain later. And we must believe in Jannah and Jahannam. So from believing in the last day includes believing in Jannah, uh, believing in Jannah and Jahannam, believing in Hellfire, and believing in Paradise. And also, from belief in the Day of Judgment, is to believe that we will be punished in the grave. So there is a punishment in the grave that will happen. So, in terms of life, there's four stages. So we said that Yawm Al Akhir, the Day of Judgment, is the final stage. The first stage is when you are in your mother's womb. So you're not fully born, but you're in your mother's womb. That's the first stage of a human being. The second stage is your life in this dunya. The third stage is your life in Barzakh. Now, Barzakh is a world, it's from the unseen, that is between this world and between the hereafter, meaning the day of judgment and um, Jannah and Jahannam. So Barzakh is basically your life in your grave. That's what Barzakh is, life in the grave. So we believe as Muslims that there is a punishment of the grave and in the grave you will be either showing, showing your place in Jannah or you'll be showing your place in Jahannam and there is a squeezing that will happen that every single person will feel. 
And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that had it not been for the fact that I'm worried that you will never bury your dead, I would have let you listen to the punishment that people are receiving in their graves. So it's one the people are getting punished so badly, they're screaming, they're shouting right now in the grave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he would have allowed us to listen to that. But the Prophet said that he was worried that you would hear so much screaming and shouting and torture that people would be scared to bury their dead. They'd think, I'm not going to put them in the grave because we don't know what's going to happen to them and everyone will just be outside. So the punishment of the grave, it's real. So the punishment of the grave, it's real and it happens. The last pillar of Iman, so we've covered five pillars of Iman now. First is, again, I know I keep repeating, but this is the best way for you guys to know it. The first is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second is, wa malaikati, to cope and believe in his angels. Wa kutubihi, to believe in his books. Wa rusulihi, to believe in his messengers. Wa yawm al-akhir, to believe in the last day. And then in the hadith, he mentions, wa tu'mina bil qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi. And to believe in the, uh, the qadr of Allah, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the good and the bad. Now the scholars then mentioned that when he first said what is Iman, when he was asked what is Iman, he said, and took mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa liyawmil akhari. He mentioned them one after another and then he said after wa took mina bil qadri. He again he mentioned and to believe. So if you go through the English translation, what is Iman is to believe in Allah, his angels, his uh, books, his prophets, the day of resurrection and to believe in Qadr. And the scholars, they mention the reason he mentioned and to believe is it shows the importance of believing in Qadr. Now, Qadr is probably the hardest one to explain and to understand because Qadr is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some people, they, they just won't get it. Or what happens is, a common thing is they have so much um, shubahat, so many doubts about Qadr. Oh, what if this happened? What if this happened? Why does Allah allow this? Why does Allah allow this? If everything's written, what's the point of me doing anything? So this is the hardest one to explain and uh, the, probably the most questions are going to come from. Um, but what I recommend for you guys to do when it comes to Qadr, just accept it. Don't go too deep into it. Because when you go too deep into it, you're just going to end up going crazy. So believe in it. And I'm going to explain what we need to believe in it. But when you look too deep into it, then... It's from, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some things that we, can, we cannot explain. We simply just say, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So there's, there's questions that nobody can explain because only Allah knows and only Allah has given that knowledge. So, like I mentioned, if you have these doubts about Qadr, best thing is to just leave it and not look too deep into it because it doesn't bring any benefit. Okay, so Qadr. Qadr is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there's four different stages or levels of Qadr. The first is that you believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of everything. So the first is ilm, to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knew every single thing that has happened in the past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every single thing that is currently happening. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows every single thing that will happen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows the past, he knows the present, he knows the future. And we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who has knowledge over everything. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which goes back to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-alim, the all-knowing. So the first is ilm, that we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. The second is we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kitabah, which is writing. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wrote his will of everything that will happen on a uh, tablet called Allah al mahfuz So this is the preserved tablet. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created the pen. And then he told the pen, write. And the pen wrote every single thing that will happen until the end of time. The pen wrote everything that will happen 50,000 years before creation. So every single thing that will happen has already been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 50,000 years, forget 50,000 years from now, it's not 50,000 years from now. 
it was 50,000 years, not 50,000 years before now, it was 50,000 years before creation. Before he created creation, 50,000 years before that, every single thing that will happen has been written. So your Qadr has been written. The fact that you were going to be at Westminster uh, University sitting in this lecture theatre, listening to this lecture, was already written 50,000 years before creation. The fact that you were going to study at Westminster, the fact that whatever happened in your life, for the good or the bad, has happened, has already been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is he does, whatever he does is the best for his slave. So that's why... Um, I'll mention brother on the way here that it's important for you guys to read istikhara. You guys know istikhara, right? Istikhara when you make a dua, you're asking Allah, you have a choice of something and you don't know what to do. Now, commonly, people only read istikhara for marriage when they're thinking, oh, is this the right guy for me? Is this the right girl for me? They do istikhara, but that's not the only time you do istikhara. The the mess, uh, the companions, they were taught istikhara and they were taught to do istikhara on a regular basis, all the time. So whenever you have a choice and you're not sure what to do, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, read istikhara. Because in the dua of istikhara, you are saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever you decree, if it is good for me, then bring it to me and make it easy for me. And if it is bad for me, then keep me away from it and make me happy with your decree. So this dua, the dua of istikhara is something very, very important. I recommend you all to learn it. And to use it at every opportunity. Even when you come into university, before you came here, when you applied for UCAS, when you applied for it, maybe uh, Westminster wasn't your first choice, or maybe it was. But if it wasn't, you do istikhara, and you know the fact that you came here, even though it might not have been your first choice, that it was the best thing for you. Because you made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you made istikhara, and you said to him that, Oh Allah, if me going to this other university is good for me, then bring it to me and make it easy for me. And me, if me going to this university is bad for me, then keep me away from it. And from his knowledge and from his wisdom and from him answering that istikhara is that you didn't get to that university. Or for example, let's say the example of marriage. Now you're saying that, okay, this person that I want to marry, you're unsure whether you want, you know, they're, they're the one. So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if this person is the best for me, in my dunya and my deen then bring them to me and make it easy for me and if they're not then keep them away from me and make me happy with your decree so you might actually really like this person and you really really want to be with this person but because you've asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you've said that you know I've, I've left it in your hands if they're not good for me then keep me away something will happen and you won't end up marrying that person so if you do istikhara before every choice that you have then you know that whatever did happen even if it was out of your hands, then it was for the best. Because that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. So that, that was going off in a bit. Um, so back to the point of what uh, belief in qadr is. So he said that belief in qadr is belief in uh, his des destiny. So the first one is belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge. He's in. Second is kitabah, that he's written everything. The third is belief that uh, al Mashiach, which means that belief that everything that happens is through his will. So everything that happens is through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. You can't do anything except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed you to do it. Now humans, they have free will. Like I mentioned, this is where people, they get a bit, uh, they may, might misunderstand. They might misunderstand that um, if we have free will, then how is it everything is by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, you have free will, humans. We said that angels don't have free will. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will. The choice that we make was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. So, now, if I ask you, do you want to have this bottle of water or do you want to read this book? Now, you made the choice to take the bottle of water. That was your choice. You had the choice. But Allah knew you'd do that and he wrote that you're going to take that bottle of water. So, you have the choice. No one can argue that they don't have the choice. So what some people do, they blame the Qadr of Allah for doing a sin. So they'll, they'll do a sin and they'll say that, oh, it was the Qadr of Allah did that sin. So you can't use that excuse because you doing that sin, you had the option to do it, but Allah knew you'd do it, but you still had the option. So somebody at the time, Umar bin Khattab, he, he used that excuse. He said he stole something and he said, 
Ah, I stole it. It's the Khadr of Allah. So Umar ibn Khattab, he said, and when I chop your hands off, that will be the Khadr of Allah too. So the, everybody has a choice. You can choose whether you do it or not. And if you do it, then that was your choice. And that was the Qadr of Allah. Allah knew you would do it, but you still had the free will to do it. So from the third thing is that everything happens with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last thing is that everything is from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything and that is from his will. So we mentioned that belief in Qadr has four components. The first is that ilm, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. He knew everything that happened. He knew he knows everything that is happening and he knows everything that will happen. Ilm. The second is kitabah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written down every single thing that will happen all the way until the day of resurrection. And it's written in Allah al-Mahfuz, which is the preserved tablet. The third is that everything happens with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. And the final thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. Um, and I think it's Maghrib now. I've got a message that it's Maghrib. So inshallah ta'ala, we will end it there. Um, after the Maghrib, we will have a Q&A, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have the Q&A. There is some more I can go into, but I think it's good to stop it there. Um, one thing I do want to add, it's later on, but I think it's important, is in terms of Iman. So now we know what Iman are. We've covered the six pillars of Iman. Now, a common question, um, before you guys ask it, I'll rather answer it. How do we increase our Iman? So we know that we must have Iman. And we know that Iman increases and decreases. And we mentioned that Iman increases with um, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a common question is how do we increase our Iman? So Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, he says in his uh, book of Fatawa wa Rasail, he mentions that there's three ways of increasing Iman. The first is that you, um, you learn the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. So you increase your Iman by learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to increase your Iman, the best way is to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Alim. He is the All-Knowing. He knows everything that you do. Learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Basir. He is the All-Seeing. He sees everything that you do. Even when you are alone in your bedroom, He knows that you're there and He sees everything you do. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Sami'ah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the All-Hearing. Whatever you say, He knows. When you backbite somebody, He knows. When you speak good of somebody, He knows. So it works in your favor, but also works against in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is all-knowing, meaning He knows your good actions, so He will reward you for it. He is all-knowing and He knows your sins and He will punish you for it if you deserve it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-seeing. He sees your good actions, so He will reward you for it. But He also sees your sins and He will punish you for it. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is all-hearing. He hears your good actions, but He also hears your sins and he will punish you for it if you deserve it. So the first thing is to know and increase your Iman by learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. The second is by looking at the signs around you. So looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. If you look at one of the, the trees, the sky, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, that increases your Iman. When you study, uh, for those who are studying biology, maybe you're studying science, when you see one of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human body, and how everything is perfect. And when you look at the universe, when you look at the signs of the universe, you look at the stars, the sun, the moon, etc., etc., and you even look at within yourself, you look at the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, you look at the times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you from something, the times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something, that's a way to increase your iman. And then the third and final way to increase your iman is to constantly do acts of worship. So if you want to increase your iman, your iman is feeling low then do a good deed. Every act of worship you do increases your Iman, bit by bit by bit. So there's obviously various ways you can do acts of worship. Read the Qur'an. Read the Qur'an constantly. Make it your companion. Make it something that at least have a portion that you recite every single day. Even if you only know Surah Nas, recite that over and over again. Um, you can also read Tahajjud. Obviously, of five prayers, you have to pray anyway. But do extra nawafil. Read your tahajjud every night. You can give sadaqa. Try to give a sadaqa that is secret. And one of the seven who are shaded on the day when there is no shade, except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is somebody who gives uh, charity so much in secret that 
he doesn't know how much he's given. So he gives so much charity that he doesn't even know how much he's given. But it's in secret, so nobody knows. So that is from a good deed that you can do. Go to the masjid, go to these ISOC talks. One of you coming to these ISOC talks, um, going back to ISOC, when, when I was at QM, I found them so beneficial. When I was at Queen Mary, I used to attend these same ISOC talks. That's why I mentioned that when um, University of Westminster invited me, it was an honor because I remember how much I benefited from these talks. So I recommend you all come to these talks. They, they, they change your life. They affect your life. Go to as many ISOC events as you can. Be involved in the ISOC. Not everybody has to be a host. Not everybody has to be the uh, Amir. Not everybody has to get involved um, in terms of always being at the front. But you can help in any way. And consider that your deed. Your, maybe even consider that, like for example, when everybody's left and then you're the one who could, uh, cleans up the food and nobody knows, that can be your secret deed between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always try to have a secret deed between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nobody knows. Because it's off topic, but again, riya can come in, which is when you do something for showing off to other people. So especially when it comes to the ISOC, you can maybe, you might be, I don't know, getting involved in the ISOC because um, you, you want to show off to others. You might come to the ISOC to pray because you know that all your friends are praying and if you don't pray, they'll be like, oh, why, is, why is this guy not praying? Or you might come to ISOC talks because you feel left out. So if you have, these are deeds that are in the open. So we're not sure if we do it sincerely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows if you do it sincerely and it's possible to do it sincerely. But the best way to have a sincere deed is that nobody knows it except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think of a deed, anything. Think of a deed that you can do that nobody knows, not even your mom and dad. Nobody knows except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that can be your secret deed between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is off topic. So these are um, the ways to increase your iman. The first is by seeing or knowing the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and living them. It's no good just to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-alim. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-alim, so you know that he knows everything that you do. So you're going to be cautious and you're going to be wary. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-basir, the all-seeing. So you know that next time, if I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to do this sin, nobody knows I'm doing it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. So I'm not going to do it. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al samir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-hearing. So you're thinking, okay, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to backbite this sister, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hear me. Maybe no one will hear it, but for me and, and this boy or this girl, but you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-hearing, so you won't do it. So when you implement the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life, this will increase your iman. The second is that you look at the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around you. Uh, and the third and final is that you do acts of worship. You do acts of worship constantly and it will increase your iman. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to constantly increase our iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are mu'min, from those who have the highest of iman. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us in a gathering better than this, in Jannatul A'la. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us and to grant us ikhlas in everything that we do. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallim ala nabina Muhammad wa akhri da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan.